Welcome to Christ United Methodist Church. My name is Chris Dowd. I'm the senior pastor. We are delighted to be worshiping together on this beautiful Sunday morning. Here at the beginning of the worship service, please do let us know that you're here. If you're in the sanctuary, there are two ways to do that. You can scan the QR code on the back of your bulletin, or you can take a, a check-in card from the pew back in front of you, fill it out, and drop it in the offering plate when it comes by. If you're worshiping with us online, there's a convenient check-in button for you to use. Children are an essential part of our worshiping community, and if your children are with you today, there are children's worship bags at the back of the sanctuary, and we hope that you'll stop by the Jeep and get them connected into all of the wonderful things going on in our children's ministry. The fastest way to find out all that's happening here at Christ United Methodist Church is to visit cumc.com connect, or following worship, you can visit the Get Connected table in the narthex. It is so good to be together as the body of Christ, worshiping together. We're glad you're here. All right, good morning, everybody. It's great to see you on a beautiful Sunday morning. We have some of our youth who are returning from youth retreat, uh, but we're all here together in a warm sanctuary. Would you please stand and greet one another? All right, so next week is the first Sunday of Advent. I'm gonna let you in a little secret. It's technically not the first Sunday of Advent, but we're gonna make it the first Sunday of Advent because of what we're doing on the 24th. All that will be revealed. Plus, I don't think anybody here is like worship police or liturgical police or whatever, so we feel just fine about that. Um, but we do have a special uh, sermon series coming up. We showed this video last week, uh, but Sam did a great job with it, so we're going to show it again now. This Christmas season, Christ United invites you to something special. Your music is so loud. Will you please knock it off so that I can write my sermon? I'm telling you, it's very out of character. And I, <laughs> and, I <laughs> and no organists were harmed in the making of that promo. <laughs> she's, she's good. So the other thing that starts with, uh, next week then would be the lighting of the Advent candles on the, on the Advent wreath. Um, we do have slots that are available for you to sign up for your family or just you personally. You can go to cumc.com slash connect and do that, and again, that begins next Sunday. Uh, then in, let's see, I guess it'll be a week from Friday, right, As if I'm doing my math right, we're gonna have um, turkey dinner and a Christmas movie. So if, you've, if you just need to be reminded of what A Christmas Carol is all about, we're gonna have two different versions of that movie showing. We're gonna have um, a classic version here in the sanctuary. We're gonna have a Muppet Christmas Carol in Underwood Hall. We're gonna, before that, have a dinner together that is catered, so we need you to sign up, please. cumc.com slash advent is a place to go for that. You can come to both of those events or just one of those events, whichever you prefer, but it'll be a good way for us to kind of kick off the, the season in earnest. Uh, the flowers here on the chancel are given by Linda Morin in loving memory of Vic, and those are his favorite colors. They're beautiful. Blessed be his memory. All right, if you would please rise in body or in spirit. Uh, I guess I'm calling you to worship. Okay. 
Reagan's preaching. We're all doing different stuff this morning. Most gracious God, you crown the year with your goodness. We bless you for the order and constancy of nature, for the beauty of earth and sky and sea, and for the providence that year by year supplies our need. And with our thanksgiving for these blessings, accept our praise, O God, for the eternal riches of your grace in Christ our Lord, to whom with you, O Father, and the Holy Spirit, be all glory and honor and worship forever and ever. Amen. Now let us join together in praying the Apostles' Creed, the traditional version. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated.
Oh, kids, we are so thankful for you, and we're thankful for, for Angie and Catherine and Robin and Debbie on the piano. We're just so thankful to have the gift of a children's choir. And this time, I'm going to invite um, the Cole family up of Taylor and Kyle, and we're going to have the honor of baptizing little Nora Lynn. Um, so Taylor is, if you know Twyla Weber, longtime member, it is her granddaughter. So this is her great-granddaughter that we get the um, honor to baptize today. Taylor uh, was baptized uh, along with her sister by Don when you were like 18 in this church. So a long history, a great connection to this church. And so we are just excited to see so many family up here and down there. What a great, great day. Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We're incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given a new birth through water and the spirit. All this is God's gift offered to us without price. I present Nora Lynn Kolb for baptism. All right, so in the United Methodist Church, um, we baptize infants, and what that means is that their parents, uh, the child's parents, make a commitment for her, in this case, uh, to raise her in the church and to teach her the things that we learn as followers of Jesus, and then someday, um, It'll go by faster than you want it to. Uh, she'll be confirmed and be able to answer these questions on her own. But here's, here are the historic questions of our faith. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? We do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Do you confess Jesus Christ as your savior, put your whole trust in his grace and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? Will you nurture Nora in Christ's holy church that by your teaching and example she may be guided to accept God's grace for herself, to profess her faith openly and to lead a Christian life? All right, and I'm gonna pray over the, the water now. Hi, Nora. Oh, wait, okay. God, we know that uh, before anything existed that you were there and that your spirit was within the waters and the water continues to be a powerful image throughout scripture. And so we know that your spirit comes upon this water today. May we know that this is a gift of water, a gift of your presence, of your grace and love and that upon Nora's head, that it'll be a reminder of how much you love her. So we ask your Holy Spirit to come bless this water and bless little Nora who will receive it. Amen. Amen. Okay, kiddo. <sighs> Yay! Okay. Hi! Oh my gosh, you're adorable. Okay, here we go. Wait, I, got, I have two boys, so I always struggle a little bit with dresses. Okay, there you go. That makes noise. It'll make a lot of noise. Okay, this is a little bit chilly. The water is here. I'm going to show you. What do you think about that? It's going to be okay? She said, well, we'll see. Yeah, okay. By what name will we baptize this child? Nora Lynn, a wonderful name. Okay, kiddo. Nora Lynn, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And the people of God said together, Amen. And we pray that the Holy Spirit would work within you, that being born through water and the Spirit, you may remain always a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Sorry, I should show her off to y'all, but she's super cute. There we go. And the people of God again said, Amen. Right, and um, as we baptize children, uh, we know that there is a part of the congregation that we get to make a vow, a promise to, to help raise this child. And so uh, you will have a response in just a moment. Members of the household of faith, I commend Nora to your love and care, whom we this day recognize as a member of the family of God. 
Will you endeavor so to live that Nora may grow in the knowledge and love of God through our Savior, Jesus Christ? We will so order our lives after the example of Christ that Nora, surrounded by steadfast love, may be established in the faith and confirmed and strengthened in the way that leads to life eternal. Amen. Let's welcome Nora into the household of God officially. of a little mini-series called Gratitude, and I'm thankful to be here this morning. And often I get the question, as I'm sure Chris and Mike do when, they're, uh, when it comes to pro- uh, sermons, is what's your process? Like, how do you pick the scripture? What sources um, do you use? How do you know which ones are, are good or which ones are not good resources? What do you look for? Um, how long do you spend on it? How many times do you rehearse it? How does the Spirit really speak to you? How much do you pray about uh, what you're about to say? Now, since I'm not an every week preacher, I have a lot of time in between between my sermons to to think and reflect and and pray. And so this week, as I sat down to, to really start working on it, of course, the first thing I did was go on Google and I typed in, what famous people have non-famous friends? So, pretty biblical question, really, if you think about it. And I uh, ended up going down the rabbit hole of reading about Taylor Swift and her girl gang. But don't all roads lead to Taylor Swift right now? Like, I feel like she just is all over the internet. At least that's how mine is. See, I guess I'm kind of intrigued by famous people that deal with us, I guess you would call us what, peasants, common folk, groundlings, I don't know what you would call us. Um, I'm intrigued by them. Um, I'm intrigued by uh, famous people that marry non-famous people or people that um, after they get big, they remain married to the person that they met that knew them before they got really big. Because I think there's something really fascinating and important to when it comes to people that are famous is that they, they don't forget who's been there all along, the things that happened that made them uh, get, to, that helped them get to where they are today and, and how maybe they continue to be grateful and, and maybe humble. 
And so today's scripture, we're looking at a time when the Israelites, um, we kind of reflect back on where they've been and where they are now. And so when I looked at it, I thought, well, this will be a pretty easy message. This will be about how we shouldn't forget what God has done in the past, that God was with the Israelite people, how to be grateful. But I found this story led me in a few different directions because scripture is really rich like that. But most of all, it made me see the wilderness with new eyes. So today's reading comes from the book of Deuteronomy, um, chapter 8, verses 7 through 18, and we're going to go ahead and get to it. Hear these words. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with flowing streams, with springs and underground waters welling up in valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive trees and honey. Sounds just like Kansas where I grew up, just like it. It's really God's country up there. Um, a land where you may eat bread without scarcity, amen, where you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron and from those whose hills you may mine copper, you shall eat your fill and bless the Lord your God for the good land that he has given you. Take care that you do not forget the Lord your God by failing to keep his commandments, his ordinances, his statutes, which I am commanding you today. When you have eaten your fill and have built fine houses and live in them, and when your herds and flocks have multiplied, and your silver and gold is multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied, and then do not exalt yourself, forgetting the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, who led you through the great and terrible wilderness and rid wasteland with poisonous snakes and scorpions. He made water flow for you from Flint Rock and fed you in the wilderness with manna that your ancestors did not know, to humble you and to test you, and in the end, to do you good. Do not say to yourself, my power and the might of my own hand have gotten me this wealth. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, so that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your ancestors as he is doing today. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, many of this room are probably fairly familiar with the story of the Exodus, but in case you have forgotten or maybe it's been a while, I'm going to give you a very short, condensed version of it. So the Israelites, God's people, had been um, under oppression for a very long time. They had been in slavery for generations in Egypt. And there's this man named Moses that um, is spoken to through a burning bush. It's, it's God saying, I need you to go to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. So Moses goes to Egypt, and the, he and Pharaoh have a back and forth, and there's a lot of things that go on. You can read it when you get home today. But eventually, the Pharaoh says, okay, go, go. And so the Israelites, there's lots and lots of them, end up um, getting all their stuff and, and pretty much fleeing, frantically. And they get to the Red Sea, and of course, they're like, how, how are we going to do this? And Moses, through the power of God, is able to part the Red Sea, they walk on dry land, but as they look behind them, they see that Pharaoh's army is actually chasing after them. And so they, they move quickly, and they finally get, and they, and they make it, and they turn around, and they see that the water, the walls of water have collapsed, and Pharaoh's army did not make it. So at this point, as a reader or a listener, you would think, well, it's got to be sunshine and rainbows now. All the bad stuff, all the hard stuff is way back in Egypt. God has rescued God's people. And you think, gosh, I bet the Israelites are going to be the most grateful people, right? And then we read a little bit more. And sure enough, there's disobedience, there's doubting, there's complaining, there's overstepping, there's infighting. The Israelites are in a mess. And so God's people end up wandering for 40 years before they even get to this promised land that God has been speaking about for so long. Generations die before they make it. Moses, the leader, doesn't even make it himself. And so, if you're like me, I have painted the wilderness as such a dark time in our faith history, as great suffering and no direction and feeling lost and having grief and, and anger and frustration and death. And that is true. 
There was all of that. The people experienced all of that. But I think there's more to the story, and I think I've been kind of blind to it, or I've been tempted to be ungrateful like the Israelites. But when I went back and and read, especially verses 15 through 17, I'm reminded that God made water flow out of rock and that he provided manna in the wilderness when they were starving, that God led them and protected them from poisonous snakes and scorpions. And so I think, gosh, this this is a God that provides. This is a God that takes care of God's people, that leads, that protects, that is always with them. And yet I step back in my own life and I say, but gosh, I experience sadness and grief and frustration and stress and trials. And I believe that God is good and that God is with me. And so I get in this tension of, yes, God is so good. And yet there's all this stuff that is hard and painful and things that I don't necessarily understand. And then I read this in a commentary. The wilderness was not wholly bad or wholly good. The wilderness was not wholly bad or wholly good. And for some reason, even though I've read this story countless times, it's referenced throughout our entire Bible, and I've read other separate books from different theologians talking about this time, for some reason that just hit me like a ton of bricks as I, was, as I was thinking about how do we talk about gratitude? Because I think many of us feel that tension where not everything is wholly good or wholly bad. And we struggle to find gratitude at times because there's a lot of good, but there's a lot of bad at the same time. And I thought, huh, we've got a lot in common with our faith ancestors. We have all found ourselves in the wilderness at one time or another. And maybe the term wilderness is too negative for you in describing your life, but after thinking about it and reframing it, I felt as if much of our life is wilderness. Not the wandering or or feeling lost necessarily, but the sense that there's so much good and there are challenges and heartache and stress and grief along the way, because that is what life is, is it not? And sometimes as Christians, we feel the pressure to just shout joy and gratitude all the time. And it's almost like we aren't honest in what we are experiencing, what we are really going through, what life really is like. I mean, have you ever thought about when people ask you how you are, how freeing it would be to say, you know what, this is, thanks for asking, this is what's good, this is what's going on in my life, and I'm celebrating that, but you know what, this is what I'm struggling with, or this is what is hard, or this is what's been painful for me lately. I could do a whole sermon on how we need to be more vulnerable and honest with each other, but that's a sermon for another day. But I was thankful for this passage that reminded me that life is this wonderful and complex and weird combination of all the feelings at once, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And we have a choice every day in how we view our life and how to show gratitude. And it doesn't mean we have to be grateful for maybe that really hard thing, that really painful thing that happened. I'm not saying that. But it is finding other parts to be grateful for. So we don't ignore the bad. We're not in denial. But we open our eyes. And what helped the Israelites have gratitude can be the same for us too. It's manna. It's the manna that rains down on us. That is all around us. Manna was the nourishment that the Israelites needed so they wouldn't starve. And manna for us is what sustains us and gives us strength to move forward. Manna is that random blessing that pops up around us. Manna is that thing that brings you comfort in the most challenging and hard moments. Manna maybe is some sort of open door that you didn't think was ever going to happen. Manna is maybe a group of people that have come into your life and surrounded you. And yes, manna can be literal food when we are hungry, but it can also be so much more. Manna is far beyond just food. 
And when we look around and when we remember or maybe reflect back on those extremely trying or even devastating times, it's the manna around us that got us through it. Maybe we missed it while we were going through it, but as we look back, we see the manna that God provided. And that promise that God is always with us can ring true. Through the people and other moments, it is a, it is a reminder that God still gives manna. Manna is all around us. Manna is what moves us to be grateful and have gratitude even in the hardest and most difficult times. So yes, sometimes we have to step back and look and sometimes search really hard, especially in those really difficult seasons where it's just relentless, where we feel like at every turn there's one more set of bad news or setback or whatever it may be And we can get really preoccupied and just see scorpions or poisonous snakes instead of seeing how God is right there with us. I'm sure we could sit and talk as a community of faith and all share about a hard time in our life, a dark time, a time that we suffered because suffering is a shared human experience. But even having the chance to sit and talk with brothers and sisters in Christ is like manna because it it reminds us that we are not alone. Life is not wholly good or wholly bad, but reframing things, seeing beyond what is here, reflecting, pausing, whatever it is, is so good for us. When I recall this story of the wilderness, I want to be part of the Israelites that were thankful for the manna and not the ones that complained because they couldn't see the manna and what it truly meant. And in our lives, we need to grow into being grateful people, showing gratitude, always looking for that manna. So does manna solve everything? Does it completely erase what is a a struggle or what is hard? Does it automatically make everything perfect? No. (laughs) I wish it did. But having it sure makes me grateful for it. It helps me get through some things. It's something I can cling to and I don't forget who gave it to me. So here's the second lesson of this chapter where the Israelites went wrong. They might have been grateful for a moment for the manna, but as they went on, they forgot who gave it to them. They forgot that where they were now, all the livestock and their crops and the gold and silver and their houses, everything that they had, they forgot that the reason they had it was because of what was given before. And we can be like that too if we're not careful. I think about how, you know, we can't forget the work of our great-grandparents, our grandparents, and our parents that helped us get us to where we are now. We can be just as quick as the Israelites to say, well, what I have is because of me. But that never really is entirely true. There are far too many people that have come before us, too many that offered us maybe a chance, a scholarship, an internship, an open door, people that simply just mentored us and, and, and trained us and loved us. And then on another level, there's, there's so many that fought, literally fought for rights and opportunities, suffered so we could be where we are now today. So many came before us that allowed us to be where we are today. I stand here today because of so many female clergy that came before me that were told no over and over again and endured so many challenges I'm part of the United Methodist Church because I had such incredible mentors like Stan Copeland and Kay Eck from Lover's Lane United Methodist Church who took a risk on hiring me back in 2009 and then just believed in me and gave me opportunity after opportunity. To Matt Vaughn and Lindsay O'Connor at Billard's Presbyterian Church who hired me for my first ministry job ever when I had zero experience. And to the camp chaplains and director David Gill at Ferncliff Camp in Little Rock, Arkansas that first planted the seed that maybe ministry could be a life calling. And of course to my parents who gave me the world through letting me do any camp I ever wanted, any sport, any activity. I was the only girl and the youngest, so yes, I got everything I wanted. (laughs) For paying for my college, for letting me study abroad, for all the things that they allowed me to do. And I could go on and on about teachers and coaches and endless mentors. 
And I can also reflect back on all the closed doors, all the failures, all the pain, all the stresses, and the grief, because life has plenty of all of that. And I see that I still had manna around me. Those people that I just listed were often my manna. And ultimately, I'm grateful to God for providing those people around me. So this story had one more lesson for me. As I think about all I have, where I've been, what I've been able to do, I have to ask myself, and maybe you do too, what do I do with all this manna? If you recall in the original story, not, not the one I read today, but when manna rained down, there were specific instructions to God's people not to take more than they needed or to hoard it. Because if they did, it would spoil. So when I read this chapter, and I think about, okay, what do we do? I think we have a call to give our manna, to share our manna, whether it's resources or money or gifts or opportunities or literal food, you name it. We are called to be a people that are not only grateful, but also bless others. Manna isn't just for us. It's for all God's people. It's for everyone. Everyone is deserving of this manna. So today I pray we give thanks for the manna that was given before us, for the manna all around us, and that we would go share this manna with the world. Thanks be to God. Amen. <coughs>
Greetings, everyone. I'm Mike Flynn, pastor of Care Ministries. We come to a time of prayer now in our service, and as each prayer is offered, I invite you to respond with, Lord, hear our prayer. Let us go to God in prayer. Giver of all good gifts, as we enter into this Thanksgiving week, we lift up to you our gratitude for your many blessings and for your mercies that are new every morning. As we continue our journeys of faith, help us to be the witnesses that you are calling each one of us to be and to offer your love and grace to a world in need. Lord, hear our prayer. And as we approach this season of hope, we are mindful that many people around the world continue to live in uncertainty or fear as a result of violence or oppression. So may your spirit grant them peace and the assurance you walk with them in whatever they are facing. May your spirit also empower your church around the world to walk with them as well. Lord, hear our prayer. And we pray for all those who are struggling with illness, those who are facing upcoming surgeries, those who are looking forward to a new member of their family, and those who continue to grieve the loss of their loved ones. May you lead them to a place of your rest and your peace. Help us to remember them and to reach out to them so they may know they are never alone. Lord, hear our prayers. We pray all these things in Christ Jesus' name, and we pray together now as he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now we come to the uh, part of our service where we lift up our tithes and offerings to God as the ushers uh, move among us. Everything that we're able to do here as a community of faith, we do through the generosity of our members. Uh, you can give via Venmo, if that's your thing, at Un Christ United. Uh, of course, you can set up a recurring gift. That's the way my family gives. Or give your gift in the uh, offering plate when it comes by. Um, this is a generous congregation and has been for 50 years. And we are able to have a tremendous impact on our community and our world. So thank you for your generosity.
Please join me now in our prayer of thanksgiving. All things come from you, O God, and with gratitude we return to you what is yours. You created all that is, and with love formed us in your image. When our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Savior. All that we are and all that we have is a trust from you. And so, in gratitude for all your gifts, we offer you ourselves and all that we have in union with Christ's offering for us. By your Holy Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Please be seated. So if you've been coming to the church for a while or maybe have questions about the United Methodist Church or what we do here specifically at Christ United, we would love to talk to you and also offer you the vows of membership if you feel you're ready. Uh, through these doors, um, Nancy will be there at the Get Connected and she would love uh, to greet you and any of us can also talk to you. Um, so next week, it's going to look different in here. There's going to be Christmas. I'm so excited. Um, and so we're so excited for the next four weeks. It's just going to be nonstop fun. So we hope that you'll join us throughout the season. So this week is Thanksgiving, and uh, I'm not blind to the fact that it may be a hard one for a lot of us here. But I pray that today the scripture would have reminded you of the manna that is all around you, and that maybe you could possibly be the manna through God's power for someone else. So may we go out into the world and be manna for all that we encounter. Amen. Mm -hmm. 